In Genesis 15, 7, the patron god of Israel says to Abraham, I am Yahweh who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. This statement that Abraham left from Ur of the Chaldeans tells us the founder of the Israelite people originated in Mesopotamia, and they are sent by Yahweh to make this journey to bring a new religion to the land. This command to Abraham not only tells us where the people of Israel claim to originate, it also tells us when they arrived. Ur of the Chaldeans gives us a timestamp for the origin of this story. The Chaldeans occupied the city of Ur around the 6th century BCE, around the same time as the Babylonian exile. I'm your host, Jason, and you're listening to Dragons in Genesis. Once the chronicler completed his coverage of the kings of Judah and the fall of Jerusalem, which began the Babylonian exile, he turned his attention to the Israelites' release from captivity and return to Jerusalem. This return and the rebuilding of the temple is recounted in the book of Ezra. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah aren't necessarily written by the same man who wrote Chronicles, but they're certainly from the same school of thought and contain the same message. Comprised of only 10 chapters, Ezra is one of the shorter books of the Hebrew Bible. Though it's widely considered to be the work of the chronicler, it contains some oddities that point to multiple authorship, or at least an author compiling multiple traditions. For instance, the beginning chapters of Ezra details the return of the exiles under the leadership of Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel the governor of Judah. But in chapters 7 and 8, the return is led by Ezra, an agent of the Persian Empire. Chapters 9 to 10 deal with the trouble of Jews marrying Canaanites, and Ezra lays out the solution, which is adopted by the Jews. However, the problem is also seen in the following book, Nehemiah. So, which man solved this particular problem? Much of the information concerning the return and construction of the temple is given twice or even three times under slightly different circumstances, leading us to conclude there were multiple traditions, and our compiler included them, attempting to assemble a single narrative despite the contradictory nature of the details. The story is largely coherent, though we're not exactly sure who did what or when they did it. Both Ezra and Nehemiah show the chronicler's fondness of Levitical importance, lists, and genealogies. But another detail that's present is the frequent interference in religious practices by the Persian government. We might expect such meddling to be viewed negatively by the Jewish authors, but the opposite is the case. Throughout Ezra, we find that it's the Persian government who calls the shots and the Jews nod and agree, changing their religious practices to suit the whims of their Persian rulers and presenting their compliance in a positive light. Rather than accuse the Persians of meddling with their religion, Ezra portrays Persia as providing the basis for proper worship and accuses native Israelites of being outsiders. Essentially, the native religion of Judah was being suppressed by Persian reformers, and the result is a new form of Judaism, which bears the stamp of Zoroastrianism. The majority of Ezra is written in Hebrew, with a few portions written in Aramaic. These Aramaic sections are copies of letters written back and forth between leaders in Judah and the Persian kings, Darius and Artaxerxes. See the end of chapter 4 to the beginning of chapter 6 of the book of Ezra. This should help us date the text, but there's a problem. Persia had three kings named Darius and another three named Artaxerxes, spanning two centuries, from 522 BCE to 330 BCE. And according to scholars, the Aramaic used in the book of Ezra only occasionally appears to be an older dialect, with the majority fitting with the writings from 300 to 200 BCE. So, sections of Ezra might have been written earlier, but it seems the book didn't reach its current form until centuries after the events depicted in this book. The last thing to cover before we get started on the book itself are the numerous decrees written by the kings of Persia. Persia. 
These decrees, duplicated in Ezra, address matters of immigration, construction, the temple, religion, and labor. Scholars have debated their authenticity for nearly a century and left us with no clear answers. But one thing is certain. These decrees sometimes contain curious language which seems a bit too convenient to be authentic, like clear statements of the chronicler's own theology in a letter meant to speak to matters of construction. These letters may have been reproduced from actual documents, but we should remember the chronicler's propensity to invent sources and alter text to support his own theology. Ezra begins by stating that it was Yahweh who stirred the spirit of King Cyrus of Persia to issue an edict concerning the construction of a new temple in Jerusalem. Just as Yahweh decided the Israelites must leave Egypt, here he decides they must leave Babylon, though contrary to his actions in Egypt where he hardened the heart of the Pharaoh to delay their departure. In the opening line of Ezra, we find it is Yahweh who inspires the king to send the exiles to Jerusalem. And where the Pharaoh attempted to prevent the Jews from worshiping, Cyrus here attempts to aid in their worship by offering to fund construction of a new temple. Ezra 2-4 through contains a copy of this edict from Cyrus, in which he outlines his offer to finance construction and declares that Yahweh is a local god who lives in Jerusalem. Heads of houses from the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, along with priests and Levites, would build the temple. What's important to note here is that Levites aren't listed as a tribe of Israel, but as religious functionaries. If you recall from previous episodes, Levites were religious leaders from throughout the land. Only later were they rebranded as a separate tribe. Here is another reference to that older belief. We're then told that Cyrus gathered up gold and silver vessels from Babylon, which Nebuchadnezzar had looted from the first temple, and sent them back to Jerusalem to be used in the second temple. But 2 Kings 24.13 and 25.13-17 tells us the Babylonians had destroyed and recycled all the precious metal looted from the first temple, which is actually more likely. It doesn't make sense that the king of Babylon would carefully catalog and store all the loot so it could be used at a later date when the Jews constructed a new temple, rather than make use of the gold himself. The mention of Cyrus sending the gold vessels back to Jerusalem is meant to link the old temple with the new. We are meant to understand Yahweh miraculously preserved these vessels for future use, and if Yahweh looked favorably on the second temple, then it must be holy. This detail is therefore an argument against the idea that the second temple was impure and apostate, an opinion which was quite prominent in the land during the second temple period. These vessels were brought forth by Mithridath, the treasurer of Cyrus, a name that means given of Mithras, and were handed off to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. We know nothing about this Sheshbazar other than that he bore a Babylonian name and that he led exiles from Babylon to Jerusalem, according to the closing verses of chapter 1. Levitical authors, such as the man who wrote Chronicles, love their lists and genealogies. The author of Ezra is no different, as the first 61 verses of chapter 2 clearly demonstrate. The author treats us to an exhaustive list of temple servants, gatekeepers, musicians, descendants of temple servants, and priests, as well as a list of men who had descendants among the returning exiles. It's likely this list was taken from some earlier source, perhaps a census of some kind, and was repurposed by the author to pad his narrative. The purpose here is to give authority to these people to classify themselves as true Israelites. One detail of note comes from verse 59, which tells us the men who came from Telmela, Telharsh, Keru, Adon, and Emer, and were sent to Jerusalem, couldn't demonstrate that they were even Israelites. The idea that many of the settlers in Jerusalem were indeed foreigners will arise again and become a prominent point of contention among those who still resided in Judah. <laughs> 
Those unable to present family records were excluded from the priesthood for being unclean. A Persian official declared they could not eat the sacred food offerings. So in Ezra 2.63, we get a clear reference to Persian government officials dictating the terms of Jewish religious practices. This will not be the first time we'll see such an occurrence in this episode. 42,360 people returned, plus their slaves, singers, and livestock, all of which are listed, of course. Despite being gone for a full generation, they all knew exactly where their hometowns were upon their return and promptly settled right where they belonged. Which is another way of saying people settled in various towns and a narrative was constructed to claim they belonged there. Which, by the way, is the entire point of this book. Chapter 3 deals with the rebuilding of the altar and restoration of worship in Jerusalem. We're to believe that after 50 years, or 70 if Jeremiah 24 is to be believed, the people of Jerusalem had just never thought to erect an altar and slaughter a goat, so only those sent from Persia could manage such a monumental task. This chapter also introduces two new characters to the story, Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel the governor. Joshua gathered all the people in Jerusalem in order to build an altar. As soon as it was completed, burnt offerings were made according to the law of Moses. Strangely, the exact details of these offerings are never mentioned, so we have no idea if the types of offerings or method of sacrifice matches what we find in the earlier books, such as Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Also, the law of Moses hadn't yet been brought to Jerusalem from Babylon. That will occur in a later chapter. They also celebrated the Feast of Booths according to the Eighth Commandment. This is from the second set of commandments that was given to Moses after the whole golden calf debacle. This list of commandments can be found in Exodus 34 and concludes with, Thou shalt not boil a goat in its mother's milk, which is honestly the most difficult commandment to follow. And this idea that they are now celebrating the Festival of Booths contradicts a later chapter found in Nehemiah in which Ezra has them follow the Festival of Booths for the very first time in history. As we know from the books of Kings, if you wish to construct a grand temple to Yahweh, you must purchase cedar from Tyre. It's the only way, and the author of Ezra knows this, so he has them do exactly what was done in previous books. And of course, Levites were appointed to supervise the work because no one knows more about stone cutting and carpentry than religious functionaries who were raised as slaves in Babylon. How exactly did they contribute to the construction? By playing their symbols as praise to their national god. I'm sure the construction crew thoroughly enjoyed that. Then we find something curious, part of a recurring theme that will eventually lead to a rift in Jerusalem. The final verses of chapter 3 tell us that the priests and Levites, who were old enough to remember the old temple, cried out in sorrow as they watched construction on the new temple. Their cries mixed with the cries of joy from those who came from Babylon. So, the people who followed Sheshbazar, the Babylonian, sent by Persia to construct a temple whose practices were in part directed by the Persian government, shouted their joy for the new temple, which was meant to replace the old temple destroyed by Babylon. But the older priest saw this new construction as blasphemous. This idea that the new temple was inferior in some way to the old temple can be seen in Tobit 14.5 and 1 Enoch 89.73. The last reference, 1 Enoch 89.73, also tells us the bread offering in the second temple wasn't pure and was rejected by Yahweh. Personally, I believe this to be of utmost importance, but that particular detail is a topic for another episode. One more thing before we move on to chapter 4. Zerubbabel, a name meaning seed of Babylon, is the governor of Judah, appointed by Cyrus and sent with the exiles to Jerusalem. But according to the first chapter, this role was filled by Sheshbazar. So what gives? 
It's likely we're seeing two different traditions being compiled here. In one version of the story, Sheshbazar was appointed governor by Cyrus and led the return. In another, it was Zerubbabel. Later, we'll see Ezra leading the return. The author doesn't know who it's supposed to be or if the return was a single event or a gradual migration that took decades, so he's including all versions of the story. The strife between the settlers and the locals escalates in chapter 4 when the residents of Judah object to the settlers building the new temple, so they approach Zerubbabel and demand to be part of the project. This seems like a reasonable request, as they too are worshippers of Yahweh, the God of Israel, and some of them actually remember the old temple. However, Zerubbabel states that Cyrus commanded that only those who came from Babylon can be involved in the construction of the Jewish temple. Again, we have Persian influence on the second temple. In response, the locals frightened off the workers and bribed officials to slow the work during the reign of Cyrus and into the reign of Darius. This detail shows ignorance of the author, as he's unaware of the history, as Darius wasn't the successor to Cyrus. That would be Cambyses. Darius I would follow him eight years later. During the reign of Xerxes, The residents sent accusations against the returned exiles who now lived in Jerusalem. Then they sent another letter during the time of Artaxerxes. This letter was written in part by Mithridath, the Persian treasurer mentioned in chapter 1. This presents a major problem. Cyrus sent the exiles to Jerusalem with the gold vessels under the care of Mithridath during the first year of his reign, which was 550 B.C a full 11 years before Cyrus even conquered Babylon. But Artaxerxes doesn't become king of Persia until 85 years later in 465 BCE. So Mithridath accompanied the exiles to Jerusalem 11 years before they were even released, and then lounged around for nearly a century before writing a letter to the king of Persia. So how old is this guy? And how long did the workers loiter around the construction site? Longer than the entire exile, apparently. Back to the letter. The opponents of the temple remind Artaxerxes that Jerusalem is a rebellious city, and their treachery is the reason the first temple was destroyed. If the rebuilding is completed, they'll return to their old ways and rebel against Persia. Artaxerxes responds by saying he learned of Jerusalem's rebellious history and has decreed that the construction of the city must stop. So the letter was taken to Jerusalem and construction was halted until the second year of King Darius, which would be 55 years earlier. Unless we're talking about Darius II, who came into power in 423 BCE. So either time travel was employed or the temple was under construction for 130 years while the same people just sat unaged and waited. Or the author has his chronology wrong. One more thing to cover in chapter 4. The author refers to the enemies of the temple as people of the land, a phrase which we'll see again in the book of Nehemiah. This is meant to say that the local residents were not part of the new Jewish community. Occasionally, it's accompanied by claims that they were actually foreigners who settled there at some prior date, essentially claiming that anyone who did not support the new temple and their theology, which was being presented in Jerusalem, was the same as a foreign pagan. We've already seen this polemic elsewhere in the Old Testament. Those who identify themselves as Israelites pretend to be ethnically distinct from other Semitic groups who live in Israel, such as the Canaanites, despite being Canaanites themselves. While those other instances provide examples of this line of thinking, this chapter in Ezra is the source. Settlers from Babylon who established a new temple and religion in Jerusalem made their claim of authority by stating they were the rightful occupants of the land who had only just returned from a decades-long exile, and those who already lived in the land were actually outsiders. The story of Moses and Joshua leading a righteous people from Egypt to eventually invade and conquer Canaan was a retrojection of this idea from Ezra into the distant past.
And it's why Abraham is said to have come from the city of Or of the Chaldees, to lend precedent that proper Jewish people come from Babylon. Chapter 5 tells us the prophets Haggai and Zechariah spoke prophecy, and this prompted Zerubbabel to resume construction on the temple. Haggai and Zechariah both have books in the Old Testament, but we're not sure if the author of Ezra used either of those as source material for this story. Another letter is sent to Persia, this time to inform Darius that construction had resumed. This letter is said to be from Tatanai, the governor of everything west of the Euphrates, though that region wasn't a single province, nor was it governed by a single man. The letter is presented in chapter 5, verses 7 to 17. In it, Tatanai tells Darius that he asked the people in Jerusalem why they had resumed construction and if a decree had been issued for them to continue. Their response, as he reports it, is that they were servants of the God of heaven, a title previously only used for Ahura Mazda and not Yahweh, and were rebuilding a temple which was built many years ago by a great king of Israel, but it was destroyed by Babylon when the people were deported. It then tells us in the first year of King Cyrus, a decree was issued to rebuild that temple, and gold and silver articles, which were taken from the original temple, were sent to Jerusalem. Shesh Bazar laid the foundations of the temple, and it's been under construction ever since, but not yet finished. So he then asked the king if he could search the archives to determine if Cyrus had indeed issued such a decree, and let that influence his decision concerning the matter. There are a couple of things to point out in this letter. First, the name of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar is known to the author as the man responsible for the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, but he shows no such knowledge of the great king of Israel who supposedly built that temple, which they're trying so desperately to recreate. This could be a simple oversight, but it could also mean that, at the time of this writing, Solomon had not yet been connected with the idea of a great temple in Jerusalem. The next thing to point out is that verse 14 tells us Sheshbazar, last mentioned in chapter 1, laid the foundations of the new temple, something elsewhere attributed to Zerubbabel. This further strengthens the notion that this is a compilation of multiple traditions. This letter and chapter 1 are from a tradition in which Sheshbazar led the return and began construction. Chapters 2 through 4 are from another tradition in which that role is filled by Zerubbabel. The idea that Cyrus returned the gold and silver vessels is only contained in the Sheshbazar tradition and isn't mentioned in those chapters where Zerubbabel led the return, despite how well it would have fit in chapter 3, where he describes the rebuilding of the altar and initial sacrifices. Lastly, scholars have pointed out that the form of Aramaic used in this letter is older than that found in other letters elsewhere in the book of Ezra, which means the Shesh Bazar tradition is likely older than the tradition of Zerubbabel. King Darius sends his response in the following chapter. After searching the archives, he finds a copy of the decree of Cyrus. However, the decree in chapter 6 doesn't match the decree in chapter 1. Just compare Ezra 1, 2 through 4 with Ezra 6, 3 through 5. The new version of the decree gives measurements and material requirements, like an abridged version of the commands in Exodus for building Yahweh's tent, or the chapter of Kings that details how Solomon built his temple. Darius decides to honor the decree of Cyrus and commands that no one should interfere with the construction of the new temple. He states that the new temple is being built on the site of the older temple, something that shouldn't be needed if Solomon's grand project had actually existed. He also decides that the state will cover the cost of the construction. Lastly, he outlines strict punishments for anyone who defies his order. They are to be impaled on a beam taken from their own house. Though later, in Nehemiah, we will find out that no one in Israel currently owns a house, and they're all going to have to live in grass huts. And this detail about impalement is a bit curious, 
You see, the word for crucifixion used in the gospel simply means to be hung up, either as a form of punishment, execution, or as a public display after execution. Roman crucifixion on an actual cross, hanging a corpse from a wall, impalement, or just letting someone dangle for a few hours before releasing them, all counted as crucifixion. Here, one of these methods of punishment, impalement, is to be meted out for the interference with the temple, the exact crime and punishment associated with Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels. Following Darius's letter, the temple is said to be completed as they prospered under the preaching of Haggai and Zechariah. They celebrated the dedication of the house of God by offering a hundred bulls, two hundred rams, and four hundred lambs. Then they made a sin offering for all of Israel of twelve male goats, one for each tribe. Then the priests and Levites were all installed according to the book of Moses. I have a feeling that this book of Moses is the scripture and rules that Ezra brought to Jerusalem from Babylon. As we will find out later in the book of Nehemiah, it states exactly that. In verse 19, we're told that the priests and Levites purified themselves and celebrated Passover, slaughtering the Passover lamb for all the exiles. This was done to separate the exiles from the unclean people of the land who were not allowed to eat the sacrifice. They also celebrated the festival of unleavened bread. With the mention of the destruction and rebuilding of the temple, the punishment for interference with the temple practices, the unleavened bread, and Passover sacrifice all in the second half of chapter 6, I can't help but wonder how much of this was inspirational for Christians just a few centuries later. Something else of note is that here the Passover ritual is instituted to segregate those who supported the new temple from those who did not just as it was also used in Exodus on a night when the Hebrews were identified by ritual to be separate from Egyptians. This ritual is meant to separate one group of believers from another and is inserted into various points in their fictive history as a reminder of that idea. This chapter, chapter 6, is the conclusion of the first half of Ezra, which deals not with Ezra himself, but the two traditions of the return and rebuilding, led by Sheshbazar and Zerubbabel. It's a triumphant ending, in which the state covers the cost of the rebuilding. The wicked enemies of the temple are sternly warned against future interference, and the temple is completed and then consecrated. Chapter 7 begins a new story, a third version of the return. This time, a man named Ezra is sent from Babylon in the seventh year of Artaxerxes. The king was moved by the power of Yahweh to grant Ezra everything he needed, including priests, Levites, gatekeepers, and temple servants. His mission was to bring the law to Jerusalem, the same mission as Moses and Joshua. This agent of Persia was directed by the king and his seven counselors to supervise Judah with regard to the law of God. We might assume this means the Torah, though it tells us that this scripture isn't to be found in Judah, but is instead brought from Persia by Ezra himself, along with silver and gold to be used to purchase bulls, rams, lambs, and grain offerings. Ezra, according to this chapter, was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses and a priest descended from Phineas and Zadok. It's as if the man was tailor-made for the job, or perhaps the grand titles were tailor-made for the man. So the new leader, the scriptures, the law, and even the sacrifices all come from Persia at the behest of the foreign king. Even vessels for the temple were supplied by the Persian ruler, though in this version they are not the same supplies and instruments that were taken from the first temple. That detail is unique to the Sheshbazar version in chapter 1. All of this is to be taken to the house of the God of heaven. Again, we see the title used for Ahura Mazda, just as the chronicler uses, and the king of Persia commands the punishment of anyone who disobeys Ezra, as his law and the law of God are treated as one. So again, we see the Persian government taking a keen interest in the religion of Judah.
Most of this information comes from verses 12 to 26, which is supposed to be a decree from Artaxerxes, though it doesn't read like any political document. Instead, it's a theological one, which mainly glorifies the Levites, exempts them from taxation, establishes Ezra as the only legitimate teacher of the law of God of heaven, and so on. Scholars have pointed out that the letter, written in Aramaic, is a mixture of earlier and later grammatical forms, evidence that it's been modified over the centuries. Another oddity in this decree is the authority of Ezra to simply seize whatever riches he needs from whomever he finds in order to complete his mission, in addition to a vast gift from the royal treasury. He can also appoint judges and magistrates to the entirety of the Persian Empire west of the Euphrates River. He essentially has unlimited power, despite no mention of him being named a governor. This isn't a historical document from any Persian king, but a theological piece meant to bolster the claims of the story. God has chosen Persia as the means to bring a new law and religion to the nation of Judah, and the messenger was tapped by the great king himself to make the journey. Also, if Ezra is given such great power but makes no use of it, entrusting instead in his God to provide, it elevates the glory of his God. This is exactly what occurs in the following chapter, and it fits perfectly with the chronicler's own theology, as we'll soon see. At the end of chapter 7, Ezra gathers to him the Israelites who shall accompany him on the return to Jerusalem. The theme of this chapter is Ezra preparing to establish Judaism in Jerusalem for the first time, as he is said to bring the law and scriptures to Judah from Babylon, and on his journey he's accompanied by the priestly class and temple servants to establish this religion. If the religion of Israel had already existed and the law of Moses along with it, then there would be no need for an outsider to journey hundreds of miles to establish those very things. And if Sheshbazar and Zerubbabel had built a temple and had been practicing the religion according to the law of Moses, as previously stated in this book, Ezra would have nothing to do. All three of these traditions seek to justify a belief system that the author attributes to Moses, but is unknown to those living in Judah. Moreover, the temple they build and the practices they institute were seen as distasteful by those who lived in Israel, as we've already seen. I'd strongly recommend listening to episodes 35 to 39 of this podcast for an in-depth look at this topic. Chapter 8 begins by listing the individuals accompanying Ezra along with their qualifications for being considered true Israelites. Again, we see the claim that true Israelites come from Persia-controlled Babylon. They gathered beside the river, a scene depicted in Psalm 137, and fasted to gain favor with Yahweh for a safe journey. This would be completely unnecessary given Ezra's unrivaled power and the fact that he's traveling under the king's authority in the Persian Empire. Also, he has 7.5 tons of gold and the authority to demand whatever else he wishes from any governor he encounters. Artaxerxes himself would have insisted on a military escort to guard such a vast treasure as it crossed his lands. And Ezra could simply snap his fingers and demand an army, and one would be provided to escort the Israelites and himself to Jerusalem. But the chronicler insists that the faithful put their trust in God instead of relying on men. See the previous two episodes for multiple examples of this theology. God is with Ezra, so he has no need of man's protection. Also, this idea of Yahweh delivering the nation of Israel from the land of Babylon to safely journey to the promised land was first seen in Genesis 15:7 with Abraham, who makes this exact same journey. Ezra set out from Babylon and was protected by divine power the entire way. They rested three days in Jerusalem before dividing the riches and making sacrifices to Yahweh. The king's orders were presented, and all the governors gave their support. The scene of Ezra's arrival with his own priests, Levite servants, in scripture is presented as if he's arriving in a vacuum. He must bring with him the means of making offerings, and even the offerings themselves. 
He must bring a law code from Persia and even the Jewish scriptures. He must instruct them on how to arrange and conduct the cult, and they conduct a consecrating ceremony as if the temple hadn't been constructed in chapter 6. At the same time, he hands the treasures off to the priests and Levites who were already in attendance in the temple. This curiosity is never addressed in the text and might be another indication that we're dealing with multiple traditions. In one version of the story, Ezra is establishing the cult from scratch, while in another version, he's simply stepping into a leadership role of an existing cult. The strangeness we see here at the end of chapter 8 is a merging of both traditions. So Ezra brings the priests and Levites to the temple only to find that those people are already there. When attempting to establish a distinct ethnic group in a mixed-race land, one must prevent the in-group from intermarrying with the out-group. Otherwise, the two will be hopelessly intermingled within a few generations. The author of Ezra addresses this subject in the final two chapters of this book. In Ezra 9, the title character learns that some of the returned exiles have married local women, an act that he considered to be apostasy. Rather than utilize the great power granted to him by the Persian government and assigning judges and magistrates to sort the matter out, Ezra takes on the responsibility of setting the entire nation to rights. Once the officials inform Ezra that people have taken wives from among the residents of Israel, Ezra cried out to God that he was ashamed of the deeds of the people and their guilt had surely reached all the way to heaven. Deuteronomy 7.3 specifically prohibits intermarriage. Numbers 25, the story of Phineas, also prohibits this practice. Luckily for the recently returned exiles, Ezra is far more lenient than Phineas. In the story in Numbers, the high priest Phineas impaled the offenders on a spear. Instead, Ezra recites a brief bit of Deuteronomic theology, the idea that a select few from the chosen people were given a holy place after their release from slavery, and they built a new temple on divine command. The people living in Israel are all unclean, and the new settlers must not give their daughters in marriage to them, nor should they take wives from among them. This is the outline of the story of Moses and Joshua. Ezra asked Yahweh if he would become so angry that he would consider destroying every remnant of Israel. In the concluding chapter, it contains Ezra's response to the problem of mixed marriages. Shechaniah confesses to marrying a woman of the land and calls for the people of Israel to enter into a new covenant before God to dismiss their wives according to the law. Like the story of Abraham and Moses, we have the establishment of a covenant involving the land of Israel and ethnic purity. Ezra demands an oath from the priests and the Levites to support his marriage reform. He then enters the changer of Yohanan, the son of Eliashib, to spend a night in mourning and fasting. This poses a bit of a problem, as Yohanan being the high priest is anachronistic according to Nehemiah 3.1. In the following book, which is said after the events of Ezra, Eliashib is still the high priest. Yet here in Ezra 10, Eliashib is already gone, possibly deceased, and his son is the current high priest. It's one more instance of the author confusing his timeline. Ezra summoned all the exiles in Judah to Jerusalem. Any who failed to appear would have all their possessions confiscated, but that wasn't necessary as every single person obeyed the summons. Standing in the rain, trembling before Ezra's presence, he informed them that their marriage to foreign women has added to Israel's guilt. He commands them to leave their foreign wives, and everyone in the assembly agrees that it was indeed their duty to divorce these women. Only a few people objected, but the rest divorced their wives and sent their children away. Nothing is said concerning the fate of the women and children who were sent away. Custom demanded that women return to their father's houses, but nothing here is mentioned. Typical of the chronicler, he lists every man who had taken a foreign wife, who they were descended from, and their job title.
The chapter suggested this problem of intermarriage was widespread, yet the list contains only 17 names from among the temple staff and 67 laypersons. Perhaps the list was once much longer, and this is all that remains, but I don't believe that to be the case. I think this list is complete and represented specific individuals who were chastised for bringing guilt on Israel for being too closely linked with the old cult. And the text implies the guilt belongs to the entirety of Judah to prevent further disobedience. This chapter seems to settle the matter, but in Nehemiah 9, the problem with intermarriage is ongoing and must be dealt with there. So again, we have multiple versions of the tale one which is settled in the time of Ezra, and the other that is handled during the time of Nehemiah. And both are included in this history. That's going to wrap it up for this episode. We will continue this examination when we cover the book of Nehemiah, which actually contains a chapter that belongs in Ezra, along with some duplicate information. But we might do something special next month before our coverage of the book of Nehemiah. We'll see. If you'd like to support the show, there's an Amazon wish list in a pinned post on my Facebook page. The books in that list help with research for future episodes. You can also shop the merchandise from my Zuzzle store, which can also be found on that same post. Just visit facebook.com slash dragons of Genesis. You can also support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash dragons of Genesis. If you have any questions regarding mythology in the Bible, send them to me at dragonsandgenesis at gmail.com, and I'll try to answer your questions in a video on my YouTube channel over at youtube.com slash dragonsandgenesispodcast. Don't forget to give a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast, and check out the site at dragonsandgenesis.com for links, episode information, and a list of recommended reading. And as always, thank you for listening. Thank you.